Good morning, Living Church. We're so excited that you are here with us this morning in the house of God and watching online. So wherever you're at, let's stand to our feet and let's worship together. What does it mean to be saved? Isn't it more than just a prayer to pray? More than just a way to heaven?
above what it looks like And I want what you want And I want kingdom come church I just wanted to take a moment and get into prayer if you have a need if you have a need would you just lift your hands up you know at Living Church we believe in the power of prayer and so we're taking intentional time right now to get into that to speak some truth some love whatever you need just remember that even when you don't see it he's working father God right now we thank you Lord that you are the way maker that you are the defender, Jesus, the healer, the provider, Lord. You see the need, you know the need, Jesus. So for whatever it is right now, Jesus, I pray that you would just bring a reminder to our hearts, Lord, that you are working, even when we don't see it. Thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen. People of God, shout amen. has broken the curse and he has never lost 
one battle. Sing. Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? Why? Because Jesus defeated the darkness, and he has never lost a battle. Come on, church, sing this part with us. Sing. And he never will, he never will. Come on, sing truth this morning. And he never will, he never will. And he never will, he never will. He is my faithful father. He's calling me out of the dark as night. And I cannot whisper away what he said in a lie. He is my firm. He is my firm foundation. My anchor won't be moved. Cause storms may collide, but my soul is on fire with his word. Oh, sing with. So when listen to the sound of power, of power on my lips. Cause Jesus defeated the darkness, and he has never lost a battle. Sing. And who are you, great mountain? Tell it that you should not bow low. Cause Jesus defeated the darkness. And he has never lost Oh, what a battle Sing when Oh, when listen to The sound of the power The power on my lips Cause Jesus Jesus has broken that curse And he has never lost Oh, what a battle Sing And who are you, great mountain That you should Never lost a battle. No. He's never lost a battle. Our great defender, sing. Our great defender, the one who fights for you. Yeah. Our strong tower. Find peace in him this morning. He's never lost a battle. Hey, he's never lost. You're singing some truth this morning, Living Church. Say, and our great defender. Strong tower. Come on, speak it, speak. He's never lost a battle. No, he has. And he's never lost a battle. across our mountain and sometimes we get stuck on looking at it in the face of looking at it of looking at our insecurity in the face of our debt in the face and we stay there but we need to pay attention to the next lyric and it says that you should not bow low 
because God, because Jesus is the only God, is the only name. He is your defender. He is your provider. And so this morning, I want you to look at that mountain and say, I don't know where you came from, but you didn't come from the Lord. And so there is no room for you in my household. There is no room for you in my life. And so step away, car troubles, step away because my eyes are fixed on the Lord. Sadness, step away. Financial debt, step out of the way because my eyes are fixed on the Lord, on my great provider. And so when we sing, who are you, great mountain? I want you to stand firm and talk to your mountain this morning that you should not bow low because Jesus is the only God. He is the only name. And so we are going to proclaim that this morning who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low because Jesus has defeated the darkness. Jesus has broken that curse over my life, over my family. Say, who are you? Say, and who are you, great mountain? Sing it, come on. Sing, who are you, great mountain? And who There's hope, and he never will, he never will, and he never will, he never will, and he never will, he never will. And who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? Because Jesus defeated the darkness, and he has never lost a battle. Sing. And who are you, great mountain, that you should not power? Jesus defeated the darkness, and he has never lost my battles. And he never will, he never will. And he never will, he never will. Come on, find peace in that. And he never will, he never will. Come on, keep repeating that. And he never will, no matter your circumstance this morning. And he never will, no matter how big it may look like. And he never will, he never will, yeah. And he never will, he never will. And he never will, he never will. Father, we find peace. We find so much peace in that, Jesus. That no matter how it looks like, we know that your arm is not too short. Father God, that you are making a way where there was no way, Father. You are our great defender, my strong tower. And so we find peace and we have hope in knowing that you have never lost the battle and you never will. We thank you and we're thankful for that this morning, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Give a shout to the Lord this morning, Living Church. Hallelujah, we thank you, Lord. Yeah.
Good morning, Living Church. It's so good to see everybody here this yes. morning. What a beautiful crowd, man. We're so pumped that you're here today. Yeah, week two for this amazing series. Yeah, it's such an exciting day. I'm so excited to be in God's house. But you know, today we're celebrating something really special. Yes. Today, we're celebrating pastor appreciation. That's right. You know, I don't know about y'all, but I believe that we have the greatest pastors in all the world Without here a doubt, at right? Living Church. Yes. We are so blessed to, to follow in the footsteps of, of people that just are in tune and, and are just in lockstep of what God has for this church, yeah. this community, and it's amazing. It's exactly. Amazing to see it. We're so, so I, yeah, we've got them here. I'm going to bring them on out. Well, there you go. Come Let's ha have them I'm come gonna, forward. I'm we want to take a moment and honor yeah. them, and then we want to take a moment to pray are. over them. And so, man, Pastor Trustin and Rachel, they lead this house with excellence, with love, with grace, and with so much understanding from the Holy Spirit. And so I'm super grateful for who they are as people and as friends. Yeah, the really cool thing about it is that not only are these our pastors, Pastor Trustin and Pastor Rachel, our pastors, but they're, we're honored, Winnie and I are honored that they're our best friends too. And so the cool thing is that we get to see what everybody sees on Sunday, but we also see who these people are yeah. through the week, day in, day out, on a Tuesday night, on a Wednesday morning. We get to see it. And let me tell you, they're as genuine as what you see on stage that's right. on a Sunday that's as true. throughout the week. And man, that's humbling and that's a, that's a blessing to Whitney and I yeah. to be able to see what God's doing in and through them that's in right. their everyday life That's right. beyond just what we see on Sundays. Man, we want to take some time to honor them today. You know, the Bible tells us to show honor where honor is due. And yes. so we want to bless them with a gift, with a love offering. And so I told y'all at the first week of October we were going to do this. So I hope you've been saving your pennies, that you've been not going to Starbucks so that you can bring a blessing to them and to their family. Because, you know, the job they do here, they don't see it as a job. But the truth is it never stops. And That's so right. they're serving and loving and giving and pouring out all the time. And we want to be able to pour back into them. And so you can give uh, online at livingchurch.com. But when you give, change the tab from the regular tithe and offering to pastor, the word pastor, and it'll go towards them. Text uh, a dollar amount to 84321 and include the word pastor in your text. And it'll go to them as well. Or you can give in the giving station and write on the envelope, pastor or PT and Pastor Rach, whatever That's you right. want to write on there, and we will make sure that it goes towards a love offering to just show them how much we love and appreciate and value them. If you guys would just reach your arms out, well, let's pray for these guys. Who knows they need prayer this morning, right? That's yes, right. all the prayer. God, we love you. We yes. thank you so much for Pastor Trustin, Pastor Rachel, and their family. God, I thank you for what you've already done in and through them, but we are going to continue to do in and through them. God, yeah. I pray for protection. I pray for provision and blessing on their home. God, I pray that you'll keep your hands upon them, God, and, and light their path in every direction that you want them to take. God, I love you and I thank you for my friends, for our pastors, and I pray that it's just getting started. So I pray that great things happen through these guys and we love you, we thank you for all of the many blessings that you've done in them, God. And we know that you're gonna continue your good work in them, God. We love you in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. amen. Amen, amen. Can we take one more moment to show them our love and appreciation this morning? I'm gonna take these guys off. Okay. You finish it up. If it's your first time here with us, can I just say welcome? We're so honored that you're here, and I hope pretty quickly you find out that you're actually in one of the greatest places in the world. I really love this house, and I'm so honored we get to be a part of it. We would love to make sure you're well taken care of today, so you can text the word LC Guest to 94090. That just allows us to make sure you are well taken care of, that your experience was safe and sanitary and spectacular. And man, I know that I hope that you're gonna wanna keep coming back and be a part of the family of Living Church. You know, this year has been crazy. I don't know about you, but for me, man, it feels like 2020 has been the longest year and the shortest year all at the same time, right? And you know, it's election season, and if you turn on the TV for like five minutes, everybody mad, all the our ads are saying, he's a liar, he's a liar. Oh man, it's kind of overwhelming, you gotta turn it off and take a moment. But you know, I feel like this year's kind of felt like that all over the place, that there's division and there's strife and there's stress. And the Bible tells us that if my people, God says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, 
and turn from their ways, then he can hear us and he can meet us and he can heal us. And so, you know, here at Living Church, we're in this series that God doesn't have T-Rex arms, but we are a church that is led by the Holy Spirit. And so we believe, we know that God is telling us that we need to put a pause on the series next week and take a week to just pray, to humble ourselves, to say, God, meet us and help us. We repent for the places and the areas in our lives, but God, come in and be Lord of all. Come in and take over and, and take care of. And so next week, we're gonna do just that on Sunday, all day long. It'll be a day of prayer, a day of worship. It'll be a very powerful day as we come together in unity. Because where there's unity, there's anointing. Where there's unity, there's power. And so we're gonna come together in the name of the Lord. And so maybe you and have a friend, maybe someone in your family, there's been division in this season. I encourage you, invite them to come and be a part as we together, as the body of Christ, not one side, not another, not one race, not another, but all of us the body of Christ here on earth that looks just like heaven, right? That we would come together and worship and praise and in prayer to God. So be here, don't miss it. It's gonna be an incredible day. Bring somebody with you. And then moms and dads, bring your kiddos with you because man, they've been having a rough year too. You know those kids, it's been tough for them. All the different things that happen uh, and that get canceled, that get shifted. But next weekend we have an opportunity that we can give some kids some candy, y'all. And that they can wear a costume and be a little bit silly, but Candy Craze at Living Church is not canceled, y'all. After Living Kids next week, they're gonna get a treasure map where they can go and collect candy all around Western Middle School and uh, be able to just have some fun. You know, we don't lean into a holiday like Halloween because we're all excited about it. No, we lean in because we see it as an opportunity. An opportunity to show kids that, hey, church is fun, God is fun, and He loves you and we do too. And so it's gonna be a great time. Again, they can wear their costumes, they can show up and have, we got dinosaurs everywhere right now anyway, right? They might as well partake and have fun and get some candy and then moms and dads, they'll have a sugar crash. They'll take a nap and hopefully you can too. But it's gonna be a great day. I'm so grateful for everyone in this house who gives with uh, so much love and expectation, so much generosity, that's who you are. And because of who you are, because you're so generous, because you've said yes to trust God with your finances, with everything that you have, and because you give to this house, we're able to keep seeing the stories of people whose lives have been changed, who found their forever family, a church family here in this house. And so I encourage you, stay faithful to God. I know you gave your gift and your blessing to Pastor Trustin and Rachel, but also be sure to be faithful in your tithe and your offering today. You can give online, livingchurch.com slash give. You can text a dollar amount, 84321, or you can give in the stations as you leave. But man, God's doing a new thing, y'all, here. In this house, he's doing an incredible thing, and we're so grateful to be a part of it. And so week two is starting. Week two, God doesn't have T-Rex arms, y'all. You better wake up, get ready, pay attention. Here it goes. Good morning again, Living Church. Super excited about week two of God doesn't have T-Rex arms here at LC. Like Pastor Whitney said, we got T-Rexes all over the place, running around in kids, on the videos. But you know, T-Rexes, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, is the most famous of all the dinosaurs. And there's been a number of times that he showed up on the big, big screen, both in movies and on television. Obviously, we all know from Jurassic Park, the first time, or one of the greatest times that we see the T-Rex. But growing up, I saw 
the T-Rex on TV all the time. One of my first scary movies I remember watching was the original King Kong. And so this week, I told Rachel, I said, baby, you got to watch King Kong with me. And she started laughing at how bad the special effects were. But it was made in 1933, so give him a break. And so then in 2005, Jack Black did the renovation of this with the new King Kong movie. I loved it. I was so excited. And i got to just tell you, then in a few weeks, the new Kong vs. Godzilla movie is coming out. So excited. I'm going to get a whole theater, so if you want to go hit me up and we'll all go see the movie together. And uh, so man, all these times that T-Rexes have been on screens. As a kid, I remember watching this movie called The Land Before Time. Y'all remember The Land Before Time? And so you had Chopper, the little uh, purple one. And so he was the uh, T-Rex. In the early 90s, there was this sitcom that came out called Dinosaurs. And so there was a whole family of dinosaurs, not the mama, remember? And so the dad's best friend was actually a T-Rex. And so he was always on the show, kind of weird looking back, like, dude, that's super creepy looking thing. Uh, And then now that our kids are a little bit older, they always watch Toy Story, and so we see Rex uh, from Toy Story, and so we love him, and he gets excited and turns into Partysaurus Rex when he gets really excited and love that. My, My kids also like watching this super sad movie called The Good Dinosaur. Have you seen this? Why are kids' movies sometimes so sad? Everyone's parents always die. It's always so sad, but my kids love it. There's T Rexes in that. Titus, when he was real little, he would watch this TV show called Dinosaur Train. Parents, Dinosaur Train? It's so weird, the theme song gets stuck in your head until for eternity, and it's like dinosaurs are riding trains? I don't understand. But maybe the most famous T-Rex of all is Barney the Dinosaur. I love you, you love me, right? Barney, why did they pick the angriest dinosaur to be this iconic kids thing? I I don't really know. But what all of these T-Rexes have in common is these little, short, stumpy arms. Ah, but Living Church, I got good news for you. Our God does not have T-Rex arms. Our God does not have a weak, short arm that's not just a cute idea for a series, but it's a biblical principle. It says this in Isaiah 59, verse 1. Surely, everyone say surely. That means 100% positive. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. That I don't care what kind of pit you think that you're in, God can reach you. I don't care how far away you feel from him, he can reach you. The arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And so if you missed last week, I would encourage you to go online, listen to that message, get that truth in your heart, because God's never been too short to reach something. All my short people out there, you know, you sometimes you can't reach something on that top shelf. Rachel, all the time, she just be jumping and just can't do it. God's never had that sensation. God's never had that feeling. He can always reach what he's grasping for. But not only does he have a long stretch, scripture says that his arms are mighty. Sun's out, guns out, that God can flex on you, that God has some might and some power. It says this in Psalms 89 verse 13, powerful is your arm and strong is your hand. Your right hand is lifted high in glorious strength. And so today I wanna talk about the hands of God. But before we do, we're going to do a science experiment. So everybody take your hands out and put them like this. Put your hands out. Everybody participate. Come on. It's going to be fun. And on the count of three, I want you to clasp your hands together, interlacing your fingers. Ready? One, two, three. Now look at which thumb is on the top. So pay attention which thumb's on the top. Okay, now put your hands back apart. We're going to do it again, but I want you to put the other thumb on top. Ready? One, two, three. Feels super weird, right? It's like I'm holding hands with my sister. Like, this is weird. Like, okay. And so let go of that one. You don't want to do that one. Now put it back the right way. One, two, three. Now, chances are, for most people, your dominant hand is the thumb that's on the top. Now, if you're not having it right, we'll pray for you after service. There's something going on. But for most of us, our dominant hand is the hand that's on the top. Most of us, we have what's known as a dominant hand. Most of us have a hand that we're more comfortable to do things with, we feel stronger with. Because of that, we have more dexterity. It's the hand that you write with, it's the hand that you high five with, it's the hand that you would throw a ball with. You know, 90% of the population is right handed. Where all my righties at? Where all my righties at? I'm a righty. Now, the lefties, they're a little crazy, so where all my lefties at? See, lefties, they got those extra, like, wires that connect everything and make it all work somehow, and so they always get excited. You know, the reason that a lot of industries design things the way that they design them is for right-handed people. The way that they make spiral notebooks is for righties. 
Us righties never understand the pain that the lefties endure having to have that little metal thing all up on their forearm while they're trying to write. They're dragging their hand through the ink. It's always a disaster for them. Scissors are made for right-handed people. Can openers are made for right-handed people. And so it's just something that we've had to pay attention to. And because you're more comfortable with that hand, it becomes stronger, it becomes mightier, it becomes more powerful. My friend Aaron is left-handed. And so he's more comfortable doing things with his left hand. He's stronger with his left hand. If we all go to dinner, we've realized that Aaron and I cannot sit next to each other, my right arm next to his left arm. Or we're constantly elbowing each other and fighting for space as we're trying to shove food in our mouths, right? And so maybe we should, we'd get skinnier if we were to sit next to each other. Maybe that's what we should do. And so he's stronger with his left hand. So if Aaron and I were to arm wrestle right-handed, I would win because I have a strong right arm. But if Aaron and I were to arm wrestle left-handed, I would still smoke that dude every day of the week. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite joke. I've been waiting a month to hit him with that one. It's not true. And it's, so, <laughs> it's so fun. But the truth is, uh, there's a small percentage of, I love that joke. There's a small, per, I'm gonna tell that joke just every couple months just for fun. There's a small percentage of people that are known as being ambidextrous, that they're dominant in both of their hands. Now, there's a couple people that have what's called duality of hands, so they're, more, they're comfortable doing different things for each hand. Maybe they write with their right, but they throw with their left, or they golf with their left, but they bat with their right. That's called duality of hands. But someone who's ambidextrous can do any task equally well with both hands. When I was in junior high, I met a guy, I had a friend, who was ambidextrous, and it was incredible. When we'd be at recess, he could throw a perfect spiral with his right or a perfect spiral with his left. He could make a jumper with his right or a jumper with his left. He could even write with his right hand and write with his left hand. It was incredible. Now, when I was in junior high, I got into trouble all the time. My mom t reminds me regularly that in sixth grade, I had 117 detentions just in one year, and so I was a mess. The only reason they didn't expel me from school is because all the things I got in trouble for were just stupid things. And so uh, when I would go to detention, back in the day, we has, used to have to do this thing called writing lines. Y'all remember, like, you would just, like, write a sentence a hundred times? And so a real sentence I actually had to write a hundred times was, I will not steal the coffee grounds from the teacher's lounge and pour them in my friend's tuba. That was a real sentence I had to write 100 times. And so I remember being in detention with my friend who was ambidextrous, and we're both writing lines for the things that we did. And I look over, and he has out two spiral notebooks. And he has out two pens, one in each hand. And he's writing his lines at the same time with both hands. And I'm looking at this dude like, you're an X-man. Like, this is a superpower. This is an incredible feat that you're able to accomplish. And so I'm immediately like, I need to learn how to do this thing. And so I start practicing. The problem is my right hand already has atrocious handwriting, and my left hand looks like you gave a pen to a drunken gorilla, and so it just doesn't work with my left hand. And so I start practicing all these things. Start trying to throw the ball with my left. It doesn't work. Trying to shoot jump shots with my left. It doesn't work. And over some time, I just realize... I'm not ambidextrous. I don't have that skill. I don't have that superpower. I'm just a normal dude. I'm not right-handed. I'm kind of upset about it. Life goes on. And so about this time of life, I start really getting connected at the youth group at our church. You know, moms and dads, it's super important that you have your kids here on Sundays for living kids. But as they grow up, there's a point that their relationship with God really becomes their own. And that happens through you helping them connect into a student ministry so that they can be alone and their worship. And so I start really connecting to God and I'm paying attention on a Wednesday night and my youth pastor starts a brand new series that he called No Fear. Now back in the day there was this graphic. Do you remember this? No Fear? Back in the day every dude who had a mullet and an IROC Camaro had this t-shirt and bumper sticker back in the 90s. If you still have it, let it go. Right it's time. Like it's over, it's done, bye. And so my youth pastor is doing this series called No Fear and he reads Isaiah 41, verse 10, and it says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And so I'm there as a sixth grader, like, 
What did he say? I'm looking at the side screen reading it. Yep, God's right-handed. <laughs> and I'm like, God's right-handed, and I'm right-handed. That means I'm made in his image. I'm a child of God. Forget you ambidextrous dude. You're a loser. I'm way cooler, right? And so I get excited that I think that God is right-handed. And so this is the very first concept I ever remember having a Bible study for. My dad helped me look up some scriptures about that talked about God's right hand throughout scripture, and there's a ton, but I just want to read a few for you. David, he said it in Psalm 63, 8. He said, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Moses knew it. He said in Exodus 15, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Yeah, it's power hand. Jesus quoted David and said this, in Matthew 22, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. God's right hand was his power hand. The disciples one time got into a little argument with each other about who would sit at Jesus' right hand in the kingdom. Scripture tells us that after Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection, that he is right now seated at the right hand of the Father. So all throughout the Bible, God's right hand represents his power, his strength, his authority. His right hand is the hand that delivers. It's the hand that rescues. It's the hand that stops the water and parts the sea. His right hand is mighty. About five years ago, Rachel and I walked through a really hard season of life. I talked about it a little bit a couple weeks ago at our 10-year anniversary, but Five years ago, man, it just felt like everything around us was falling apart. It felt like no matter what we did, we just couldn't figure it out. And I distinctly remember crying out to God, God, where's your power? Have you ever been there? God, where's your right hand? Where's your might? Where's your strength? I was confused. I was frustrated. I was even a little angry. Have you ever wondered where God's power is and then you start to feel frustrated with God? Because you're like, bro, hello. Like, do you see what's happening here? Like, are you going to show up and like smite someone? Like, can you come along and help me with your power? I remember being frustrated like, God, where's your power? Because I sure do feel real weak right now. Where is your strength? Because I sure do feel tired. Where's your authority? Because I'm surely defeated in this situation. God, where's your help? Because I feel stupid and don't know where to go. Where are you? Where's your victory? It felt like in our ministry, things were falling apart and we just couldn't seem to get it all together. It felt like our finances were broken. It felt like relationships we had worked on for years were just evaporating before our eyes. And all the stress from work or the church, I would try not to bring home, but you know, (laughs) Stress follows you where you go. And so the stress got into our home and it started to cause issues in our marriage. Right about the same time, uh, Lillian was becoming a toddler. And so as our first child was starting to get older, Rachel shifted a little bit in who she saw me as. Because I was no longer just her husband, but I was now a dad. And her dad had really hurt her growing up. And so she now had these new lenses that she was seeing me through. And in the moment, we didn't realize it was happening. Because you know the devil's sneaky. You'll think that you're fully healed from something and then you step into a new season and he brings up an old attack to try to break you down because that's what he tries to do. That's why we have to stay on our toes. And so there's all this chaos and all this animosity and all this confusion. Um, We're both becoming negative and angry and depressed and fearful. It's like everything in life is hitting the fan. It's like the cow literally backed up to the fan, turned it on high and aimed it at me. And then all these people in my life, it's like they brought their fans and their cows over to my house and started pointing their problems in my direction. And I'm like, I got enough problems coming on my own fan. Y'all can get away from me with that mess. And isn't it funny how when you're in the hardest moments, the people that you think should help you are the ones that just start throwing more stuff your direction? It's one of those. And we're just crying out to God saying, God, where is your power? Where's your hand? I thought that you were with me. Have you ever been there? Maybe you sat and heard my message last week, and you're like, yeah, God doesn't have T-Rex arms. Cool, Pastor Trust, cool. You know? (laughs) And it's hard to hear because it feels as if God hasn't reached into what you're going through in a while. You hear me up here, no T-Rex arms, and you're like, shut up, right? 
because life can feel like it's erupting and like nothing's coming together and we're crying out, God, where is your power? Maybe you came to church today exhausted. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe everything in your life has changed and you don't know what's up from down. Maybe you feel angry or resentful. Maybe this whole COVID stuff has really messed you up. Maybe the election has got your blood pressure on boiling and you just can't seem to calm down. It's like everything's exacerbated, exaggerated. Everything's amplified right now. Maybe you're feeling like how I was, that God, where's your power? And so I remember in that season, I did what a lot of Christians have done throughout the years, I'm sure, is I started to read the story of Job. So Job's a guy in the Old Testament that, man, he really went through it. He really walked through some chaos, and throughout it was crying out, God, where's your power? Scripture tells us that Job was a wealthy man. He was successful. He had esteem among his city. But the enemy, the devil, came and started attacking his life. The Bible says that Job lost all of his crops, all of his herds through fires or storms or thieves, that all of his houses fell down from earthquakes or getting burned to the ground, and that all of his children even died. His servants were killed. Everything is looking horrible for Job. And he's crying out, God, where's your power? Then the devil sends a whole new level of attack on his life, and it's no longer only external, but it's now internal. The Bible says that he broke out with boils all over his body. And the only way he could find any relief was to break a piece of pottery, scrape the boil till bleeding, and let dogs lick his wounds. You want to talk about the bottom of the barrel moment. After that, Job's got a couple friends that come over, and his friends tell him, hey, Job, all this is happening to you because you made God angry with you. There's nothing worse than friends with bad theology. And so these friends come over and start saying a bunch of stuff about God that's not even true. Then his wife shows up, and she's a real piece of work. She says to him, Job, your breath disgusts me. And he's like, seriously, lady? <laughs> like, I'm at the end of my rope. You're talking about my bad breath? Where's my tic-tac? Be quiet, right? And she says to him, you should just curse God and die. Job, just kill yourself. Just end your life. It's not worth living. But Job stayed faithful. He stayed faithful. He didn't turn his back on God. He didn't run away, he, even though he didn't see his power. Right. And so as I was reading through this story a number of years ago, I came across something in chapter 28 that I'd never noticed before. That's why the Bible's so good. It's alive and active. It'll speak something to you in one season and something totally fresh in another. And so I'm reading and it says this, Behold, I go forward, but he, speaking of God, is not there. And backwards I look, but I do not perceive him. But on the left hand, where he is working. It's the first time in all of Scripture that God's left hand is mentioned. Where he is working. I do not behold him as I turn to the right hand, but I do not see him. You see the four directions? Job says, in front of me, I don't see how God has anything working powerfully in my future. As I look into my past, his power was definitely not there because look at the destruction. As I look to his right and mighty hand, I don't see him doing anything. But as I look over there to the left, he's up to something. It's too far. I, I can't see what he's doing. I don't know what he's working on, but I can see some movement. I see he's up to something over there. Can I tell you, there's been moments in my life that I've been mad at God that his right hand isn't showing up. There's a season in Job's life that he was mad at God that his right hand wasn't showing up. And there might be a season right now in your life that you're a little frustrated that you don't see God's right hand. But hey, living church, his left hand is up to something. His other hand is up to something. He's working on something. He's moving some pieces around for you. His left hand, his left hand, his left hand. Job went through a lot of things, but yet he didn't curse God. He didn't run away from God. But the reason I believe that he was able to stay faithful is because he understood that we serve an ambidextrous God. That we serve a God who is ambidextrous. You see, when I was in junior high, I had it wrong. God is not right-handed. 
Because if God was right-handed, that would mean that he has a dominant hand. And if God has a dominant hand, that means that he has a weaker hand. But there is no weakness in my God. There's not an ounce of inadequacy in who our God is. He is strong and strong. He is mighty and he is mighty. He can push and he can push. He can pull and he can pull. Whatever he needs to do in whatever direction he needs to do it, God has all authority and all ability. There is no weakness in my God. Scripture says that he's enthroned in the heavens. That means he uses the galaxy as a beanbag, that he can kick his feet up on the footstool of the earth and do whatever he needs to do. There is no weakness in the God that we serve. But in my season of heaviness, I was frustrated that I couldn't see his right hand of power. But I came to teach you one thing today. One thing. It's that when you can't see his power, you can trust his plan. (laughs) His right hand is his power hand, his mighty hand, his conquering hand, but his left hand is his planning hand. You see, God swings a hammer with his right, but he's playing chess with the left. He's moving people out and moving people in. He's closing doors and he's opening doors. He's making paths straight that used to look crooked. He's doing things that you don't understand with his left hand. So I want to caution you and remind myself Don't get frustrated when you don't see his power because you can always trust his plan. He's up to something. God's working for your benefit no matter what's happening in your life. We sang it earlier today, Waymaker, Miracle Worker. The song says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Just because we don't see the power Just because we're waiting for God to drop the hammer on a situation doesn't mean that his hand isn't working over here. Our God is not asleep on you. He's not slumbering. He's not on vacation. Our God is awake and aware, and his ear is open to our cry if we cry out, and his hand is working for our benefit. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10 says this, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in when the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your, plural, hands the place that we live right now is because of the work of his hands the reason that there are tectonic plates in the earth and there's reasons that mountains are formed is because of his power but the reason that we have oxygen to breathe because there's trees and photosynthesis that cleanses our oxygen is because of his planning hand you see he's not just a god of power he's a god of strategy He's a God of systems. He's a God of influence. He's a God who says, you know what, this might take a little while, but let me work these things out to bring a blessing into my son and daughter's life. We have to understand we can trust his plan. As he works with his right, he's going to keep working with his left. He is mighty, and he is mighty. So Job is questioning God, where is your power? Where is your power? But I'm going to stay faithful, and it says this in Job 42, verse 12. So, the Lord blessed Job. Why? Because he was faithful. The Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even, here's our word, more than in the beginning. Living Church, can I tell you something? 2020, it's only half time. It's only half time. I know some of you feel like this is the end of your life. It's not the end of your life. It's just half time. God's been working in his left to do something that you have not seen or imagined above and beyond what we could even ask or think. God's working for you. God hasn't fallen off the throne of heaven. Scripture says that he's up in heaven. He can do whatever the junk he wants to do. God's in charge. And he can make a way where it seems like there is no way. But you see, it was not only God's power that blessed Job, but it was his plan that blessed him. When we don't understand where his right hand is, we can trust his plan. We sang the song today that he's never lost a battle and he never will. Good God, that song was so good. He's never lost a battle, and he's not gonna. You might feel like his right hand isn't doing anything, but his left hand is setting it up. Because I know you don't see the answer. Job said, I don't even know what he's doing over there, but he sure is up to something that he wants to bring blessing into my life. Well, pastor, this is a cute idea, T-Rex arms. Now you're talking about ambidextrous God. Where else is this in scripture? I'm glad you asked. Psalms chapter 23, verse 4. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now I said that like Coolio said it, but Coolio just stole it from David. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Listen, your rod and your staff, 
they comfort me. Your rod and your staff. A shepherd would have two implements to be able to successfully do his job. In one hand, he would carry a rod, and the rod's job was to beat away the wolves. The rod's job was to stop the thief from stealing the sheep, but the, in the other hand, he held the staff, and the staff had a little crook on the end, and he would use the staff to help guide the sheep, to help lead the sheep, to make sure the sheep didn't fall off a cliff, to make sure it gets to the water that it needs to drink. It was his plan hand. And you see, I think that the Bible says that our God is a good shepherd. And that in the same way that a real shepherd holds a rod and a staff, that our Heavenly Father holds the power and a plan in his hand. Come on, somebody. That we have to understand and believe that we serve an ambidextrous God. That's who he is. Y'all know the verse I'm about to read. You already know it. You got it on a coffee mug. You got it on a Christian t-shirt from the 90s. You go to Mardell's, they got it printed in like 900 things. Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the p -p 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 plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to do what? To prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I want to have a positive future. I want to have a hope. I want to live under God's prosperity. Now, all those words sound like power words, but how do they actually come to fruition? for the plans I have for you. Yeah. It's God's planning hand that actually brings the prosperity, the provision, the direction in our life. It's his planning hand that sets up our life. And in the hard moments that you don't see God's right hand, his left hand has been playing chess. And in 2020, I've been getting frustrated. I gotta just be it. I've been getting frustrated. It seemed like Living Church had momentum, that we were unstoppable, that we were growing, packed for service, about to go to Willie Pig. We're gonna grow, we're gonna double. Womp, womp. Right, and then COVID hits. Social distancing is now a thing. As we've been tracking what God's been doing, we're now about 60% of our attendance that we were pre-COVID. And while a lot of people say, Pastor, you should celebrate that. Most churches are 20 or 30%. Well, we don't, we're not in a competition with other churches. We want to fulfill everything God's called us to do. And so I'm like, man, it feels like we've lost something. God, where's your power? And he just has to remind me, hey, son, Trust my plan. I'm up to something. And as now I've got a little bit of foresight in the situation, in the last six months, do you know how many new people have came into Living Church? Some of you in the room right now, you're only here because COVID happened. And what God's been doing, he's been bringing in heavy equipment. He's been bringing in men and women who will be future pillars in this house, but it only happened through his planning hand, that God can take what the enemy meant for evil, and he can turn it around for our good if we'll remember that that's what he's up to. You see, God's long game is way better than the devil's short-term attack. <laughs> his long-term game, his long-term plan is way better than the devil's short little jab. The devil has T-Rex arms. The devil can only reach so far. He only has so much wisdom. He can only do so much, but our God has a much better strategy. We just have to trust it. Even when we don't see it, he's working. Not only is it evident in Job, but it's evident all throughout scripture. All throughout the Bible, we see men and women crying out for God's power, but they finally trust and see his plan. I think of Abraham and Isaac. Remember Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. Well, the thing about that is Abraham and Sarah only had one son. His name was Isaac. And so one day when Isaac is a grown man, God speaks to Abraham and says, hey, Abe, I want you to make a sacrifice to me. And Abraham's like, cool, I've made lots of sacrifices. He says, yeah, yeah, this one's different. I want you to sacrifice your son, your one and only son, Isaac. And Abraham's like, uh, what'd you say? And so God tells him again, and so Abraham decides to be obedient. And so he gets Isaac, and he gets a bunch of stuff, and they go, and they start climbing up Mount Moriah. As they're climbing up this mountain to make a sacrifice on top of this hill, Isaac asks his dad, hey, Dad, I see the wood and the fire and the knife, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says to his son, trust God. He's going to provide. So they get to the top of the mountain, and they build the sacrifice, or they build the altar, and Abraham, he says, hey, Isaac, um, it's kind of awkward, but you're the sacrifice. But because Isaac trusts not only his earthly father, but trusts his heavenly father, he submits to the process that he doesn't all the way understand. 
And so he lays down as a grown man, 30 years old. His dad at this point is well into his age. He could have just like 300 kicked him down the hill and went back home and nobody would have known what happened. But instead he submits to the process and he lays down. The scripture says that Abraham takes the knife and he holds it up over his son. And as he does, that God shouts out from the heaven, Abraham, stop. And God says, I'm not going to ask you to do something that I have not yet done. Because see, in God's plan, he's going to make the ultimate sacrifice. In God's plan, he's going to sacrifice his one and only son. He's not going to ask Abraham to do it. And so Isaac gets up from the altar, and as he does, he looks over, and he sees stuck in a bush a ram. They go over, and they get the ram, and they bring it on the altar, and they make the sacrifice that God wanted them to make. What Abraham didn't know is as he was climbing up the right hand of this mountain, shouting, God, where is your power? That God's left hand was bringing the ram that he needed. And right at the moment that he needed the thing that he needed, God is seldom early, but he's never late. He gave him the thing that he needed. He made a way where there was no way. We serve an ambidextrous God. When we don't see his power, every time we can trust his plan. We've got to understand that we can trust his plan. <laughs> but we might be saying, but God, where's the provision? Where's the ram? God, show me the thing that you're going to do. I want to know the end game of your plan. And God's saying, would you just climb the mountain first? <laughs> it would have been easy for Abraham to stand at the bottom of the mountain like, eh, no, like, tell me your plan, God. But instead he's faithful. He's obedient. He does the thing that he's called to do. And because he climbs up the mountain, he receives the miraculous. We're asking for the miracle before we're willing to get out of the boat and try to walk on the water. But we have to have the faith to do the thing. God, we've got to have the faith to do the thing that he's called us to do. Put yourself in that position. I think about Ruth. She saw God's plan. Ruth is in a tough situation. She doesn't have no money. She can't even feed herself. So she's out in a field that had already been harvested, picking up little pieces of grain, putting it in the pockets of her dress to go home and make a loaf of bread. And while she's crying out, God, where is your power? God's bringing Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, with his left hand. All throughout scripture, Pastor Whitney preached a few weeks ago on Gideon so powerfully about how Gideon had 30,000 men, but that 30,000 dwindled down to 300. And Gideon's freaking out. God, where's your power? What Gideon didn't know is that God's left hand, his planning hand, was causing dissension in the enemy's camp, which would bring Gideon victory. Remember King Saul? Big old mighty King Saul, head and shoulders taller than anybody in the land? He had a problem. Nine foot tall, nine inch human tank called Goliath. And he's saying, God, where's your power? Send some bears out of the woods or something to fight this dude. I don't want to fight him. But what Saul didn't know is that God's left hand was bringing a little shepherd boy named David to come and kill Goliath. Remember Jonah? Jonah is called by God to go to Nineveh to reach an evil people. But instead of going to Nineveh, he goes the actual opposite direction to Tarsus. While he's on the way, a storm arises. And the dudes on the boat that he's traveling on find out that it's because of him, the storm's there. They throw Jonah overboard, and he thinks he's going to die. And I'm sure that Jonah was crying out, God, where's your power? You're just going to let me drown here? But God didn't save him in power. He swam up in a plan. And here comes a big old whale to swallow up Jonah and put him back on course to go to Nineveh where he was called to be. Can I tell you something, church? You might be 100% out of God's will. His left hand is still working for you. Moms and dads, I know you're nervous about your kid who's far away from God. His left hand is still working. His left hand is still positioning some things and bringing people into a relationship with them. Maybe you don't have to preach to them. Somebody their work will. Pray for the light that's going to be in their life because God's left hand is always working. All throughout scripture, we see God's left hand. Probably the greatest example of an ambidextrous God is in the life of Moses. Remember Moses? Moses is born in a real sketchy time in history when the Egyptian pharaoh made a decree that every young boy had to be killed because they were afraid the Israelites were going to revolt and escape Egypt. They had been slaves there for 400 years. Well, Moses' mom, Jochebed, was not down with that law, and so she gives birth to Moses and then hides him. But as he starts to get too big, she can't hide this growing boy, and so God tells her to do something that is straight bananas. She tells him to put him in a basket covered with tar and go put the dude in the Nile River. And so Jochebed's got to be saying, God, where's your power? There's got to be a better plan than this. And so she puts Moses down in the river and sends him away, and we see God's hand 
his hand of power over Moses as he floats down the river. He's protecting him from crocodiles and hippopotamuses, right? And he's protecting him as he's going down the Nile River. But God's left hand is doing something that Jochebed doesn't know. God's left hand is moving in the palace. And God brings the Pharaoh's daughter down to have a pool party down to the edge of the Nile. And as she comes down, we see God's hand of power and God's hand of a plan come together. And the princess picks up baby, baby Moses and draws him out of the water to begin the thing that he's actually called to do. We see God's hands connecting. Moses goes on living this weird life of contradiction. He's fully Hebrew, but he's growing up and being educated as an Egyptian. Have you ever felt like you don't fit anywhere? <laughs> He doesn't fit with the Hebrews because he's too Egyptian. He doesn't fit with the Egyptians because he's too Hebrew. And he grows up in this weird dichotomy, not understanding who he is. As he grows up, he sees one day an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And he gets mad and he goes and gets in a fight and he kills the Egyptian. He hides his body in the sand. Well, news gets out, TMZ was there hiding, taking pictures, and so it gets out that he had done this thing. And so God leads him with his left hand to go to another city called Midian. And God's plan takes him way off course. He's in this random city in the wilderness. But while he's there being a shepherd, he has his burning bush experience. He meets his wife who later saves his life. And he learns how to navigate the wilderness. So finally, God says, Moses, it's time to come back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So he does and Pharaoh's not having it. And so God's right hand shows up in one of the greatest ways in all of the Bible. God starts dropping plagues on Egypt. Boom, 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 hammer, hammer, hammer. He's sending rain, he's sending fire, he's sending frogs that have been weird. He's sending hail and water turned into blood and all this crazy stuff. We see God's mighty right hand. And then finally, Pharaoh's had enough of it and he says, okay, y'all get out of here. Y'all can leave. But Moses has a whole other logistical problem that we don't talk about. He has a logistical issue. He's got upwards of two million, three million people that he's taking out of the wealth of Egypt and he's gonna take them into the wilderness. He's been in the wilderness for 40 years previous to this. How's he gonna feed all these people? How's he gonna provide for all these people? They're dressed as slaves. They don't got a savings account. They don't got no money in their pocket. And God wants him to go build some wealthy temple out in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't have any resources to do this. But there's a little verse that we overlook when it comes to Moses. It says this, Exodus 12, verse 36. The Lord, God, caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. This is a crazy idea. Egypt was the most financially blessed nation to ever exist on earth. They had more wealth in Egypt than all of America today considered by the standards of the day. Unbelievable wealth was in Egypt. And in this moment, as Moses and the people are walking out, it says they stripped them of their wealth. People are running out throwing bags of gold and silver give them keys to their Bentley. They're pulling Mona Lisa off the wall, giving it to Moses to sell on eBay. I don't know what they're doing, but they're blessing him with all of these things so that they can go out and be provided for. But can, can I go just a little bit deeper? Can I, can I go just to see the ambidextrous God? <laughs> the way that God provided for Moses and his people in this moment started way before Moses even had the need of it. God provoted, provided for Moses 10 generations before through a guy named Joseph. Joseph was Moses' great, 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 great grandpa. Joseph was just a dude who lived with his dad. He had a whole bunch of brothers. And these brothers didn't like Joseph because his dad gave him a fancy Technicolor dream coat. And so his brothers get jealous. They take his coat and they throw him down into a pit. Are you with me? So they throw him down into this pit. And while they're in, he's in the pit, he's crying out, God, where's your power? What, where are you, God? What's ha why am I in this pit? Come down here and save me. But what Joseph doesn't understand is he doesn't see God's power is that God's plan is coming in a caravan. There's a caravan of slave traders coming by. His brothers were about to kill him, but instead they sell him for 30 pieces of silver, just like some other guy. And so they sell him to these slave traders and these guys take him to Egypt. Well, now he's in Egypt. He doesn't know why he's there. He gets sold to a guy named Potiphar. 
He starts working for Potiphar. Well, Potiphar has a freaky cougar wife who can't keep her dirty hands off a young, sexy Joseph. And so Joseph's like, get up off of me, lady. And she's like, "Uh uh-uh. And so she lies on him and gets him thrown in prison. So now Joseph was in a pit. God, where's your power? Now he's in prison for doing nothing wrong. God, where is your power? I'd have been a little mad if I was Joseph. I'd have been a little bit bent out of shape. Like, God, are you for real? And I'm now in prison in a foreign country. But see, God's plan was still working. God's setting up chess pieces that he didn't know about. So in comes his new cellmate, his celly. His cellmate used to work for the king. Well, one night, God gives his, cell, his cellmate a dream that he doesn't know how to interpret. Well, Joseph has the ability to interpret the dream. And his cellmate's like, dude, this is incredible. And Joseph says, hey, whenever you get out, go tell the king I'm in here and I can interpret any dream he has. Well, a few days later, the cellmate gets out and guess where he goes to work? For the king. But that joker forgot about Joseph for three years. That's a long time. It's a long time to be locked up in something. So I understand that you might be saying, God, it's been too long. He's playing the long game for you. His left hand is still working on your benefit. So three years later, the king of Egypt has a dream that nobody can interpret. And the cellmate finally says, ooh, my boy, old Joe, he's still down in prison. Go let that dude get a haircut and put some new clothes on and come meet the king. And he's pulled from the prison into the palace. He interprets the dream for the king and the king puts him second in command of all of Egypt. Here's the dream the king had. The king had a dream that Egypt would be prosperous for seven years. But then after seven years of prosperity, there would be seven years of famine. So God gives Joseph a plan. And the plan is that over these seven years, to save as much grain as they can. So Egypt, for seven years of prosperity, goes into overtime, building barns and silos, amassing food. After seven years, the whole world suffers a famine. There's no rain. People are starving. And in that season, people from all over the region start coming into Egypt with gold in their pockets. And they show up at Joseph's front door and they're trading bags of gold for bags of grain. And in this seven years is where Egypt became the superpower that it was. How do they build the Sphinx and the spear pyramids? And how do they put gold and everything? Because of this way that God had a plan. And so generations later, when Moses, his great, great, great grandson, is about to take all the people into the wilderness and doesn't know how to pay the bills, doesn't know how he's going to afford to put gold and all this stuff in a temple that God's told him to build, the way that God paid for it is through 10 generations previously through his great grandpa. Can I tell you something? God has been dealing with your problem before you even knew you had one. God has been working on your behalf before you even prayed the prayer. And so when you're saying, God, do you even hear me? I want you to remember that he's been working out the solution before you even had the problem. (laughs) Moses as a little baby in the basket did not know he was going to need that kind of financial provision, but God did. And so God started moving chess pieces decades before God's working for you. He's working it out. I know that you don't see how you're going to get out of the dilemma that you're in. I know. I know that you think that because of the family you grew up in, you're only ever going to get to this level. You don't know the power of our God, that his plan is even stronger than anything you've ever seen him do. If you're impressed with his power, you've got to watch out for his plan because our God's got a meaner left hook than a right jab, and he's going to work that thing out for you. So... Joseph, he's the second in command in all of Egypt. He has all the wealth, all the power, all the fame, but he's missing the thing that he actually wants most. His family back. His family, his dad that he loved, his younger brother, all these other brothers, this extended family, he misses all of them, but he's in Egypt and they don't have cell phones. He can't get on Facebook and see what they're doing. Then one day he's just doing his job, just faithful. Gold for grain, gold for grain, gold for grain, being faithful. And here comes a knock on the door. Guess who it is? His brothers. His brothers come in, they don't even recognize him. He's got on all these new Egyptian 
garb. He's wearing all these headdresses and paint and all this stuff. They don't even know who he is. You see, people who used to know you before Jesus won't even recognize who you are now. That's a whole other sermon I don't even have time to talk about. And so they come in, and instead of him cursing them, he accepts them. And God restores the broken relationship. While he's been crying out, God, where is your power? God's plan has been bringing his whole family along the whole time. How did God build his nation into millions? He put them in an incubator called Egypt. He incubated his people in Egypt through not his power, through his plan. When his power needed to show up and set them free, his power hand showed up. But his plan hand is the thing that set it all up from the beginning. And as Joseph's brothers stand in front of him, he says something that's incredible. We find it in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says to his bros, you, all you guys, bros, you plotted evil against me, but God turned it into good in order to bring about this present result to save the lives of many people. God, he turned it for good. He turned the situation that looked like a disaster into their good. And can I tell you something? That situation that you think crushed you is going to be the thing that defines who you become. Our heavy seasons are just the launching pad for where God wants to take us in our life. God will turn it. He'll turn it. He'll turn it for our good. You know, if you're going to turn something around, you got to push it and pull it at the same time. you got to have a power and a plan. I plan to turn it, but i got to have the power to do the thing. Can I tell you that God will take your problem and he'll turn it for your good? It's not just an Old Testament concept. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, it don't matter what it is, that in all things that God works, he turns it around for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. God will always turn it for good. He always acts within the consistency of his character. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if he did it for Job, he can do it for you. If he did it for Moses, he can do it for you. If he did it for Ruth, he can do it for you. If he did it for trust in Rachel, he can do it for you. I don't know what your problem or your difficulty is, but we got a God with a mighty right hand and a mighty left hand. He's got great power and he's got a great hand for you. Isaiah 59.1. Surely, proof positive, guaranteed, take to the bank. The arm of the Lord is not too short to save. He does not have T-Rex arms. He has a mighty reach and a powerful hand of power and planning. He's an ambidextrous God. The first verse that I read today was really the first Bible verse I ever really remember paying attention to that my youth pastor preached all those years ago. And now as a man with some life perspective, let me read it to you again. Isaiah 41.10. Fear not. Let it just sink in. I know there's plenty to be afraid of. There's plenty to be afraid of, man. With the disease, with the cure, with the elections, with the animosity in our country, with financial decline. There's a lot of things to be fearful of. But this God, a mighty God, he says, fear not. Why? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed. Don't be weakened. Don't be brokenhearted. Don't be put out. Don't be shaken. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. You understand that God is not only the God of living church, but he's the God of your house. He's not just the God of like a big group of people, but he's a God of you. He's your God too, if you want him to be. For I am your God and I will strengthen you. He doesn't say that I'm gonna make it all easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. That's not what he says. He says, I'm going to strengthen you. One of the things that God does is he doesn't remove the weight, but he strengthens our legs. He stiffens our back so we can bend a bow of bronze, the Psalms say, that no matter what it is that we can be mighty, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my victorious right arm. But if his right hand is invisible, 
you learn today that his left hand is working that his plan is coming to bring blessing into your life will you stand with me this morning living church with all the things that we've seen God do with his right hand I really believe that we're going to be amazed at what we see him do with his left I don't know what 2021 holds I don't nobody does well, one guy does but what I do know is that he's been setting some things up and planning and positioning and that he's gonna bring the thing into your life from a direction that you never even thought of <laughs> this whole book is full of God making ways where there were no ways of him doing things that don't even make sense we're trying to build a building in the middle of a global pandemic but God can make a way because even if we don't see his power we trust his plan we know that he's working it out for our good. And so if you've got a situation in life, if you walked into the service today feeling tired, alone, beaten down, afraid, overwhelmed, I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up? Not just to me, but to God. Say, hey, God, I got some stuff. I've been asking where your power is. God, I don't know what your plan's up to, but I want to pray for you. Father, you see your sons and you see your daughters. You see these people that you intimately love God, I don't know what they're going through, but you do. And I ask that you help them to keep this truth not only in their mind in this moment, but tomorrow and the next day and into their life, that we would be able to trust your plan that you're working. Father, I ask that you would expeditiously work it out, that you would bring relief to your people, though that they would find freedom in that situation. I speak to every marriage to be whole. I speak to every mother in this room that wishes to have a baby in her arms that you would bring blessing. I speak to every single person who's been being faithful that's waiting for that next step in a relationship that you would bring their Boaz. I ask for every family that doesn't have the means to meet all their needs that they would be obedient and you would open the floodgates of heaven. I pray for every business that's about to close. God, bring in a new breath bring in new financial vitality. Lord, I ask that we would have business owners in this church that would be vibrant in the kingdom. Lord, for people that have health issues, that the doctor's given them a report, Lord, that they would understand that you're working it out. Lord, I speak to those bodies and I command them to be well in the authority of the name of Jesus. I speak healing in this house. You know, before we go, the Bible says that all of us have sinned. All of us. That's super me, like times 10 included. And that when we sin, it, it separates us from God, just like it did Adam and Eve in the beginning. But that broke God's heart so much that he sent his son as the ultimate sacrifice to pay for our sin. And all we have to do is say, hey, God, would you lump my sin into all that stuff you paid for? Would you include me too in all the forgiveness? that all we have to do is confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he's Lord and God will make us new. And so if you're here, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here, you need to say, you know what, I'm far from God. I haven't asked him into my heart. I haven't asked him to forgive me my sins. Can I tell you this morning, God is not mad at you. He loves you. We have this really messed up idea that we think God's angry with us. He's a good father. He's a good shepherd. He's literally fighting the devil for you every day. And he's literally wanting to lead you to fresh water. He's a good God. And all we have to do is ask him to forgive us, and he will every single time. So if that's you on the count of three, would you just raise your hand up? Would you raise your hand up? Your hand isn't as mighty as God's, but he wants to see it. And I'm going to pray with you that God would forgive you of every sin. On the count of three, raise your hand up. One, two, three three. That's you this morning. Yep, I see you all over the room. I see you in the back. Yes, sir, I see you. This whole crew up here. Anybody else? I'm so proud. Anybody else? Yep, I see you. Yep, right here. All over the place. Say, yep, I see you right here, my man. Anyone else? Say, today is my day. I want to ask Jesus in my heart. Living Church, would you pray with me and the, I don't know, 10 people that rose their hands in this service? Everyone say this. Dear God, everybody, dear God, forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. Make me new. I don't want to be who I was. I want to step in to everything you made me to be. And so from this day forward, I'm going to live for you. The old me is dead. And the new me is alive. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Amen.
Come on, put your hands together for all those that prayed this prayer this morning. Now, I'm so proud of you that raised your hands this morning, but this is not the only step. Right, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. So Pastor Woody is gonna give you some details, and if you raised your hand this morning, I want you to be paying attention for next time we do baptisms. Yes. Because there's something about washing away, washing away the old, and stepping into the new. Pastor Winnie is going to tell you all about it. Yes, man, we're so excited, just like Pastor Trustman said, for the decision you've made. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And so, man, keep coming back and being a part of what God's doing. It's not the end. There's so much more. And you can text the word more to 94090. All that does is let us know that you made that decision today. It allows the pastor to connect with you and contact you. And he's right. Our next baptism is going to be on January 10th. We're going to start 2021 in the best way by stepping forward and saying, hey, Jesus, in you, I'm new. And so, man, I'm excited about it. And we'd love for you to be baptized. That registration is going to go live. You can go uh, and register to be a part of it. If you're in this place and you're here today, man, we are excited for all God's doing in your life and in your family's life. We know that he has more. And so keep coming back every week, y'all. It's so fun to grow and learn together. Was that word good for anybody? I don't know about you, but whew, that was so good for my heart and for my mind. And man, keep coming. Next week, we're going to take the time to just stop, to humble ourselves, to pray, and to say, hey, God, come in and meet us. Come in and help us and heal us. And so it's going to be a powerful day. You don't want to miss it. I hope you guys have a great week. We love you so much. We'll see you next Sunday. There's more, y'all.